I actually yesterday had a completely different idea where I wanted to go this morning. And then as I started uh, just into it, it took me in a different direction. So, hey, I'm going to take you in that different direction and let's see where we end up. You know? Do you all remember the ugly duckling? That was a less than enthusiastic. Y'all remember the Ugly Duckling? Yeah? Okay. Hans Christian Andersen, right? 19th century poet and prolific writer and, and writer of all the, the fairy tales, wrote The Ugly Duckling, and it actually came out in 1843. And I wanted to read just a little bit about the plot in case you're not familiar with The Ugly Duckling and what it was all about, and just a couple other bits because uh, I think it has something to say to us this morning. So... What's the story of the ugly duckling? After a mother duck's eggs hatch, one of the ducklings is seen by the other animals as an ugly little creature and suffers much verbal and physical abuse. He wanders from the barnyard and lives with wild ducks and geese until hunters slaughter the flocks. You know, in the old fairy tales, they, they didn't hold anything back, you know? It's like, these are supposed to be kids' books, right? He finds a home with an old woman, but her cat and hen tease and taunt him mercilessly, and once again he sets off alone. The duckling sees a flock of migrating wild swans. He's delighted and excited, but cannot join them, for he's too young, ugly, and unable to fly. When winter arrives, a farmer finds and carries the freezing duckling home, but he is frightened by the farmer's noisy children and flees the house. The duckling spends a miserable winter alone in the outdoors, mostly hiding in a cave on the lake that partly freezes over. The duckling, now having fully grown and matured, cannot endure a life of solitude and hardship anymore. He decides to throw himself at a flock of swans, feeling that it is better to be killed by such beautiful birds than to live a life of ugliness. He is shocked when the swans welcome and accept him only to realize by looking at his reflection in the water that he had not been a duckling, but a swan all along. The flock takes to the air, and he spreads his wings to take flight with the rest of his new family. Aww, right? Now, here's the interesting thing. Anderson himself was once asked by a literary critic whether he would write his autobiography. But Anderson claimed that it had already been written. He later confessed that the ugly duckling was a reflection of my own life. Anderson himself was a tall, ugly boy with a big nose and big feet. And when he grew up with a beautiful singing voice and a passion for the theater, he was cruelly teased and mocked by the other children. There was a great speculation, and I never knew this, that Anderson was the illegitimate son of Prince Christian Frederick, later King Christian VIII of Denmark. And he found this out some time before he wrote the book, The Ugly Duckling. So that being a swan in the story was a metaphor not just for inner beauty and talent, but also for secret royal lineage. That is so cool. When you think about it, think about all the stories that have the same basic motif, the same basic shape as The Ugly Duckling. Cinderella's got to come to mind right off the top, right? It was alternately titled The Little Glass Slipper. And it's a folktale with thousands of variants throughout the world. Thousands of variants throughout the world of Cinderella. About a young woman living in forsaken circumstances that are suddenly changed to great fortune, ultimately becoming queen through marriage. The story of Rhodopis, about a Greek slave girl who marries the king of Egypt, is usually considered to be the earliest known variant of the Cinderella story, recounted by the Greek geographer Strabo between, get this, 7 BCE and 23 CE. That would be 7 BC, 23 AD, if you're using the old. That's 2,000 years ago. Jesus was walking around when this thing was being written, right? That ver the version that is now most widely known in the English-speaking world was published in French in 1697, and another version was later published by the Brothers Grimm in their folktale collection, Grimm's Fairy Tales, in 1812. Although the story's title and main character's name change in different languages, in English-language folklore, Cinderella is an archetypal name. The word Cinderella has, by analogy, come to mean one whose attributes were unrecognized, one who unexpectedly achieves recognition or success after a period of obscurity 
and neglect. Cinderella story, right? The Cinderella man about the, the boxer in the 30s. It's just, it's a part of our culture, you know? As is the ugly duckling, a part of our culture. They're shorthands now. They mean something instantly as soon as we say them. Grimm's fairy tales also contain the story of the frog prince. Remember that one? You know, the kind of bratty princess who disdains the ugly frog, but all she has to do is kiss it, and it turns into the prince because it had been enchanted. Same motif over and over again. And if you think that these stories died out in the 19th century, let's consider for just a moment, shall we? Luke Skywalker. Growing up in obscurity on Tatooine, the desert planet, right? Only to find out through everything that he is the son of the great and fallen Jedi and a Jedi himself. Didn't know it. Obscure, neglected, not living with his parents. You know, got to think about Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz as well. But even coming closer, although it's getting to be a while now, how about Neo in The Matrix, Keanu Reeves' um, character? Think about that for a second. Living his life of obscurity in nameless cubicles, doing his software work, you know, day after day. But all the time, he was actually the one. He was the one who had within him the ability to break humanity out of the slavery that the machine world had put him in, had put us in. These are the motifs that continue to come down out of history, out of literature, and they continue to be repeated over and over again. And of course, as we've talked about this in here before, these are stories that we have called hero's journey. And, and it was Joseph Campbell in the 50s who recognized, he called it the monomyth, this one story that we keep telling ourselves all the way from as far back as we can remember when we were painting on cave walls and gathering around campfires at night. But we keep telling the same story over and over again. That the hero or the heroine doesn't know themselves, doesn't know what they have inside of them until they are forced through circumstance to take a journey that reveals their inner nature as they go through. Why is it that we keep telling this story to ourselves over and over again? Now, we could moralize it and say, okay, the moral is that we're supposed to look beneath the surface. We're not supposed to judge the book by the cover. We're not supposed to judge the person by their outward appearance. We're supposed to look deeper and find a person's worth beneath the surface, right? But I think it's a lot more than that. If you think about it, think about Jesus' story. Jesus is an ugly duckling too. Jesus' story is a Cinderella story. He's born into absolute dirt poverty. He's born in absolute obscurity. My goodness, when he is born, he's put into a manger as his crib because his parents didn't have any other way to care for him at the time. Nobody knows he's there. Nobody cares he's there, except just a few people who had learned to see with the father's eyes, the magi, the shepherds. A few come and find something in him that the others have missed. But that's the exception. That's, that's not the usual. When Jesus comes back from his time in the wilderness and he's starting his public ministry, and a few of the fishermen who have started to follow Jesus are all excited about the possibility of what he has to bring to the people, and they run and they find their friend Nathaniel. Do you remember this story? Nathaniel, come, you got to meet Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth? <laughs> Can anything good come out of Nazareth? I love that line. He lived in a town that had a bad reputation. He lived in a town that nothing good came out of. He's a Cinderella story, a Cinderella man, if you will. Unrecognized, unattractive, and abused, neglected, denigrated, ridiculed. Now I say unattractive, and I don't know if that caught in anybody's craw a little bit. I want to take a look at Isaiah 53. This is the, uh, the passage that is typically called the suffering servant. What we don't as much know about it is that it is one of four poems within the book of Isaiah that are sometimes called the servant songs. And they occur at Isaiah 42, 49, 50, and then here at 53. And these servant songs are clearly in the first three talking about the nation of Israel itself. 
as the servant. God addresses my nation, my, my people Israel, my servants. Now in 53, he, it's, it's not spoken of that way. But we'll talk about that in just a second. Let's just read it and, and see how it applies to the Cinderella story, to the ugly duckling we're talking about. Isaiah 53, starting right at verse 1, Who has believed what they heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. Okay, longish passage there. But notice the imagery. Notice everything that's going on here. Now, obviously, this sounds and is written as if it's speaking about one man. <coughs> but it is a Hebraism to anthropomorphize nations and people and to show them as one person. The Bible does this over and over again, especially in the Old Testament. Often, the nation of Israel was spoken about as one person, either God's son, the child of God, or a servant. Out of Egypt, I called my son, God says. That was referring to Moses bringing the people out of, out of Egypt. And so we see that figure of speech being used all the time. So even though it looks like it's speaking about one man, the Jews themselves have interpreted this passage to be speaking about the nation of Israel or alternately about the Messiah, the Mashiach, who is the one who will lead the people or both at the same time. Now, Christians have taken this as a precursor to Jesus because we believe that Jesus is the Messiah, and so this applies to Jesus as well. So Christians look at this as Jesus, the suffering servant. Jews would look at it as the Mashiach, or the nation of Israel itself. Remember when this was written. This was written while the people were in exile in Babylon. Everything about their lives had been destroyed. Their nation had been destroyed. Try to imagine what that would feel like if our nation was destroyed. If Washington, D.C. was destroyed and all the, the beautiful places and the monuments were gone. If downtown Los Angeles was gone, and we're kind of living in those smoking craters and we're being pulled. I know some of you are nodding and say that wouldn't be a bad thing, but I know where you're going with that. But try to imagine what life would be like if everything that you had known, everything that you had wrapped your life around was suddenly taken away and you were shipped off to a foreign land. 
These apocalyptic passages are there to encourage the people, to show them that even though everything looks completely lost, God is still God and God's promises will not become void. And even if God has to step bodily into history, it's going to be made right. And this suffering servant passage and the four servant songs are looking forward to a time when Israel will resurge, when Israel will retake its place among the nations of the world. And it's told from that point of view, that first line, who has believed what they heard from us and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This is looking from the world leader's point of view or from the world's point of view, just dumbfounded that this little backwater nation is actually now coming to the fore and finally reestablishing its rightful place as the leaders, the spiritual leaders of humanity, the city on the hill, the light of the nations that Israel has always seen itself as the chosen people walking with God. So this is all looking forward to that. But before they can do that, they have to come to terms with where they are right now in the smoking crater with everything gone. And that's what apocalyptic literature always does. The, the crazy imagery of apocalyptic literature is matching the people's grief. Can't be Pollyanna here. They're suffering. They're in despair. You meet them where they are, but you still show them where they're going to be going. Because what this is actually saying is that hidden underneath, hidden underneath this ugliness, hidden underneath this destruction of everything is this promise of God, is this royal lineage, all that. And so this is where these passages are trying to take us. Now we, when we think of Jesus, we imagine Jesus is beautiful. It's natural for us to do that. We also imagine that he looks like us. It's natural for us to do that as well. Because wherever you go across the world where there's Christianity, Jesus looks like the indigenous population. You know, He's going to be black in Africa, and he's going to be white in Europe, and he's going to be Asian in Asia, and so on and so forth. We all appropriate Jesus. That's just natural. But we also appropriate him in the ideal. Because of what he means to us spiritually, we think of him that way physically as well. But what is Isaiah really telling us? What are the Gospels really telling us? Because the Gospels tell the same story that Isaiah is telling us here. Jesus didn't start rich and powerful and attractive. He started exactly the opposite, in obscurity, in ridicule. And if we're only looking at what we're attracted to when we're looking in spiritual directions and we're looking for Jesus and looking at God, then we're going to be looking in the wrong spot. We're going to be digging in the wrong spot. We've done this before in here, but just in case for some of you we haven't done this. What would Jesus have looked like, actually, physically? You know, we can't know. It's interesting that none of the Gospels tell us because to the Jews that was unimportant what Jesus looked like. For us, it's everything. In the West, we're focused on form. Form is everything to us. The beautifuler, the better, right? The Jews are all about function. What does something function like? It's interesting, if you held up a pencil and you asked a, a Westerner to describe this, they would say, okay, well, it's, you know, it's six inches long, it's thin, it's yellow, it's got a point on it that you can write. Da, da, da. You know, if you asked a Jew what a pencil is, they would just say it's something that writes. They aren't going to be interested in the form, they're going to be interested in the function. If you look at the Gospels, they are telling us what Jesus functioned as, how he lived how he functioned. They don't tell us what he looked like, and yet we want to know. But forensic scientists have looked at the bones that they've recovered of first century Judean men, and guess what they have uncovered? That the average Judean man in the first century was about five foot one, maybe five foot three, and probably weighed around 135 pounds. And they would have been very dark in color, swarthy, and I love that word, swarthy. And if they had any beards at all, they would be cr close-cropped beards and close-cropped hair. Even Paul says it's, it's disgraceful for a man to wear his hair long. 
And of course, they would have been dark brown eyes. And so this blonde-haired, blue-eyed Jesus with long hair, six foot two, is something that is coming out of our own, you know, input. But what would Jesus really have looked like? He would have been muscular. He would have been strong with all that walking and that physical labor as a draftsman. But he would have been short. He would have looked like a hobbit to our eyes. How easy would it be for you to be able to accept Jesus as master? Jesus in the way that we think of Jesus when you're looking down at this short, stocky man. See, this is the, this is the dichotomy. This is the paradox that we've got to start working with because it applies in so many other ways as well. It's not just about what Jesus looked like, but what we can actually accept and where we're looking for truth in the first place. Remember the great scene where Luke finally meets Yoda and has to accept Yoda as his master? And what does he do at first? He ridicules him. He dismisses him. He doesn't even want to talk to him. Of course, Yoda's sort of playing along. But to accept this little short guy as the master who's going to teach me and bring me to my destiny, bring me to my identity, this is a hard thing to do. And yet those motifs are repeated over and over as well in our literature, where we have to change the way that we're thinking if we're really going to be able to get where we need to go. The hobbits themselves in the Lord of the Rings stories, right? It's the least of the fellowship that actually is the savior of Middle Earth. There's a reason these details <laughs> exist in these stories. There's a reason they keep being told over and over again. Jesus talks about this over and over again. That the least are going to be first. The last are going to be first. If you want to be the leader, you have to be the servant. You have to be willing to take that place. He had to empty himself in order to come into this world, and he had to empty himself again to leave it. There has to be that descent. There has to be that emptying out. And we have got to be able to see through our biases, our prejudice, our weaknesses as human beings in order to see the value in something that just doesn't look like it has any. The highest form of love that Jesus gives us to practice is the love of the enemy the one that we don't like, the one that we see as adversarial, the one that we want to dismiss, the one that we want to ridicule. Can we love that person? Jesus, is, with everything in him, is trying to get us to value without attraction, without being attracted, to be able to see beneath the surface. But as I said before, I think this is only just the beginning of the reason for these stories and the reason for Jesus' focus as he's teaching his followers and by extension us, how it is that we can walk along this path to be able to see with the Father's eyes. Jesus is never passive, ever, in what he does. He is never complacent. He never sits back. He's always active. He is always pushing forward. And he doesn't expect us to be passive either. I think this is one of the damages that we've done by looking at Jesus' work on the cross as vicarious substitution. We're not just supposed to passively sit back and be covered by him. He is always telling us, you need to do what I'm doing. And at John 14, he says just that. If you believe in me, which means if you trust me, right? Belief is never separated from trust and never separated from faith. If you trust me enough to walk where it feels risky, to walk where you're not sure, of the success of where you're going, just because you're following my voice and following my way, then you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. But this is the shape of it. He's trying to get us to see that we need to do what he is doing. And what was it that Jesus actually did, if you boil it down? First thing he did was realize who he was. And beginning to realize first who his father was clued him, him in to who he was. And the result was that he and the father were one. When Jesus comes back from the wilderness, that's what he knows. He knows who his father is. And so he knows who he is because he and the father are one. And with that 
knowledge that made him free of all of the obsessive compulsive fears that humans have because remember scripture tells us Jesus was fully human he had to walk this way himself he didn't get a pass he didn't get to be passive he had to walk this way he's telling us we need to do the same thing as well why do we keep telling ourselves stories like the ugly duckling why do Isaiah and the Gospels portray themselves the Mashiach Messiah Jesus as ugly ducklings why do they do that well because this is how life presents to us doesn't it as a paradox it's always paradox if we can't learn how to deal with paradox and let it be paradox, let it stay unresolved, we're going to have trouble with the concepts that Jesus is trying to bring us. Because beautiful things aren't meaningful because they're beautiful. Powerful things aren't meaningful because they're powerful. Attractive things are not meaningful just because they're attractive. And unattractive things are not meaningless or small or insignificant or powerless just because they're unattractive. We all start out small. We all start out insignificant. We all start out powerless. If we're fortunate, we had someone in our early lives <laughs> who still loved us, who still treated us as cherished parts of the family, even though we were powerless. And that helps. But some of us didn't have that in our lives. We didn't have a functional enough childhood to even get that little bit. But whatever we grew up with as a child, whether we were valued in our insignificance and our powerlessness or not, each one of us still has to take the journey to our own identity. Each one of us has to take the journey that Jesus took to find out what is this ultimate reality all about and how do I relate to it? In our tradition, who is this father? And who am I in relation to this father? All of our literature, all of our stories tell us metaphorically about this journey, about this hero's journey because that is the shape of every human being's journey on the face of the earth. We have to know this. And the more that it is tamped down into our being, tamped down into our spirit, the more we can actually see and feel the map and the shape of the journey in our lives, the more that we can continue to do it, even when the going gets really, really difficult. That we are able to see others first, is something that is so endemic to all of us. It's easier for us to see something in another person than it is for us to see it in ourselves. And if we can finally see others as acceptable, even when they're unattractive, if we can begin to love others, even when we really don't like them, then we may be able to start seeing something of value in us. How hard are we on ourselves? How hard are you on yourself? How much does that interior voice constantly talk yourself down and tell you that you're not worthy, tell you that you're not measuring up? How often do we do that to ourselves? We probably do it more to ourselves than we do it to anybody else. But if we're doing it to ourselves, we're probably doing it to others as well because that's the way it works. But how do we turn the corner and begin to see in another person that there's royal blood there so that we can turn around and see in ourselves that we carry royal blood as well? Because ultimately, when we find out who we are as a son or daughter of God, what we're saying is we have royal blood. What we're saying is that we are princesses. We are princes. We are swans. We're children of the king. This truth that Jesus is trying to bring us, this good news that Jesus is trying to bring us, is who we are. That is world-shattering. Can you get the feeling of that? 
We all have royal blood. Our spiritual journey is to find out that truth so that it can set us free. Set us free of all of that compromising fear that we're constantly going through. Free from the fear that we don't matter. Free from the fear that we are insignificant, that we are unlovable, ultimately. And Jesus' good news is just the opposite. Of course, you do matter. You're a swan. <laughs> the slipper fits. It fits you. You're a prince. You're a princess. You're a Jedi. You're the one. However you want to see it, that is what is in you. And to break through and understand that, first of all, and then begin to live it to its fullness, to free you from the fears that are limiting you and holding you back from doing the things that you wish you could do. And even if it's not those things, it'd be something else. But here's the catch. We can see the attributes of others long before we see our own. You ever thought about a counselor who's a personal mess themselves? I mean, you probably run into that, you know. <laughs> You're trying to counsel me, and look at your life. Well, if their life is all messed up, does that disqualify them from being a counselor? Well, I'll tell you what, if every counselor had to be perfect, no one would have one, right? Okay. And not only that, we can see the problems that someone else is going through, and we can actually help them even if we can't see the same thing in ourselves. It's just the way it is. We're inside our own bubble. We can't see what others see. I always like the, the analogy of Indian poker. You know, you take the last card and you stick it on your forehead, and you, don't, you can't see what it is, but everybody else sees your card. It's like that. Everybody can see our card, and we can see their cards, but we can't see our own. That's just the way life is. Jesus talked about that with the, you know, the log eye thing, right? You're going to take the plank out of your brother's eye when you got a log in your own eye, the speck out of your brother's eye, you got the plank in your own eye. And so he's talking about, yeah, don't be arrogant about this. Make sure that you're seeing the identity and the connection that you have with the other, but that doesn't mean that we don't help them until we are completely clean ourselves, because that, when does that day come? Stone is always getting smoother, you know? There's always more layers to the onion that is coming off. But here's the thing, as we help other people, as we see in other people, finally begin to understand that they have royal blood, that they have, as human beings, deserving of the same kind of love that I'm deserving of, as we can see that in another, as we can act on that, when we can love the enemy, as Jesus is saying, that is the first inkling of us to finally understand in a visceral way, in a way that matters, that we are loved in the same way too. That we can break through that internal voice that is denigrating us, that is telling us that we are insignificant. And we can finally, as we can love the child of God in front of us, we can finally start to understand that we are a child of God as well. We keep telling ourselves these stories because they apply to us. We are the ugly duckling. We are Cinderella. We have to break through and find our identity. Everything about Jesus' way, everything that Jesus tells us is how to do that. How do we do that? We start by loving the other. We start by seeing where we can most easily see that unseen quality that exists in every single human being. Because if we can start there, then we can turn the reflection back on ourselves and we can break through ourselves and finally be able to see our own royalty. And we can believe that we are loved. That paradox, once again. Jesus' way is all about building awareness, the contemplative way that Jesus is showing us, is all about building awareness. Without awareness, we can't do any of this work we're talking about. We're staying inside our bubble. We are separate. We are shelved off from the common experience that we're all having together as human beings. To become aware 
to let our awareness catch up to us in real time so we can make different decisions that connect us, that break through that bubble, that allows other people in, that allows us to actually be able to perceive God's presence here and now, becoming more attuned to the moment, to who's in it, to presence. This is what contemplative practice is all about. This is what Jesus' way is all about. Go back. Read those red letters again. See how Jesus teaches. See what he's telling his followers to do. See what he's telling us to do. How we pray, how we love, how we live, how we relate, all has to do with building the awareness to break through that barrier that keeps us from seeing who we really are keeps us from understanding the depth of the love and connection that we have with the creator of the universe, for crying out loud. That's our connection. It's like Hans Christian Andersen realizing he was the son of the king. Now, it didn't do him much good, but this certainly will for us if we can just break through. At a certain point, the truth breaks in without our even permission or awareness of it. We just keep doing what Jesus tells us to do. We just keep showing up, living this way, relating this way, loving this way, and stuff starts to break in. Stuff starts to come clear out of the mist. It's amazing how it works. It feels like it's all at once, but it happens incrementally at the same time. Another paradox. Go figure. That's the way life works. It's the coincidence of opposites that lets us know that we're on the right path, that we are really experiencing this, allowing the experience in the way that it needs to be, not all figured out, not all tied up with a bow, but suddenly all at once, but in a series at the same time. This is the way these revelations, these epiphanies start to come. It's amazing. We get glimpses of who each other really is and then who we are at the same time. I wanted to read one last little piece here because one of my spiritual heroes, Thomas Merton, had a moment like that. Now, if you know Thomas Merton, he was a just regular worldly guy, but felt that there was always this tug, felt that there was always something more, something that was drawing him that eventually led him to the Trappist Monastery at Gethsemane in northern Kentucky. 1950, 48, 49. That was in the late 40s that he finally knocked on the door of the monastery and was admitted. And uh, he didn't leave again for about 25 years. He stayed in cloister. He stayed in that monastery. What he originally was trying to do when he went to the monastery was to pull away from the noise and the distraction of humanity in order to find out who he was. But more and more as he stayed in that isolation, not completely, he had his brothers around him, he realized that it was the connection that he was after. But he had to go away. He had to go into obscurity. He had to go into a place that was covered in order to find out about the connection that was really at the root of what he was seeking. And one day he went to... uh, to Louisville, the capital city of, uh, I guess it's not the capital city. Is it Lexington is the capital city? Anyway, it's a big city. And he went there, I think it was a doctor's appointment or something, and as he's coming back, he's standing on the corner of 4th and Walnut, right in the middle of the shopping district in this big, bustling city. And as he's standing there, and imagine, he's been in Cloister all these years, and he's standing there with all these people on the sidewalk, walking back and forth in all the colors of the clothing and everything that's going on, And he has this moment, and he writes about it this way. Yesterday, in Louisville, at the corner of 4th and Walnut, in the center of the shopping district, I was suddenly overwhelmed with the realization that I loved all those people, that they were mine and I theirs, that we could not be alien to one another, even though we were total strangers. It was like... Waking from a dream, the dream of separateness, of the special vocation to be different. Thank God. Thank God. I am only another member of the human race, like all the rest. 
I have the immense joy of being a man, as if the sorrows of our condition could really matter. Once we begin to realize who and what we are, this sense of liberation from an illusory difference was such a relief and such a joy to me that I almost laughed out loud. A member of the human race, to think that such a commonplace realization should suddenly seem like news that one holds the winning ticket in a cosmic sweepstakes. I have the immense joy of being man, a member of a race in which God himself became incarnate. There are no strangers. If only they could see themselves as they really are. If only we could see each other that way all the time. There would be no more war, no more hatred, no more cruelty, no more greed. But it cannot be explained. There is no way of telling people that they are all walking around shining like the sun. That's what Jesus wants us to know. Our job is to leave no stone unturned. Our job is to simply follow the way, even though we don't understand all the turns, don't understand all the concepts, just show up and do the simplest things and connect, 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 choose connection. And in that choosing, we're going to find out we're all walking around shining like the sun. Let's pray. Father, this is the greatest revelation that any of us could have. Our actual lineage, our actual heritage, our actual relationship and connection with you. Help us to get that. Somehow in the midst of all the self-talk that we do, somehow in the midst of the frustration and the anguish and the anxiety that we're going to face in life, that there's another part of us that is still aware. A light is still turned on in the back of our minds, like the sanctuary light in our churches that tells us, you are our father. You are our mother. We are your children. And nothing can change that fact. That we really are royal because of you. And help us to start living as if that were true. Father, thank you again for everything that you give us, the guidance that you give us, all these wonderful stories, our scriptures, that are pounding over and over what it means to find out who we are in you so that we can actually scamper after and figure it out and find that truth that makes us free. Thank you, Father. We can only do this because you did it first, and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all stand.